Um, so thank you for inviting me. I, I'm excited to speak about this, this notion of a untapped potential between design and policy. I should be um, upfront that I've had less work to do with policy directly. And I think that's actually going to be part of what I'm going to talk about this morning in this untapped potential idea. So by way of background, my work is community-based and participatory. It's also very place-based. I live in Atlanta, Georgia. I have lived here for 15 some years now. Um, and almost all of my work takes part in Atlanta with communities here. Much of that work has to do with data, right? Uh, a kind of topic and thing that we know is common to contemporary democracies and government and policy. And I work extensively with communities as they collect and use data. And they do this for a very specific reason, which is to make claims um, to the government. And so for example, I've worked with communities who have collected data about the built environment. Um, for example, collecting data on abandoned buildings and um, building code violations that present public safety challenges to residents and that can be used to actually advocate um, for the demolition of buildings or to hold absentee landlords to task. And more recently working with housing activists who are collecting data concerning evictions and data concerning evictions that allow them to also then track abusive property management organizations. What's important about this work is that these are not data-driven organizations. These are not organizations that said that they wanted to be part of a smart city agenda or that um, had decided that you know, they wanted to do this work because they were committed to data. Rather, these are organizations that have come to realize that for the kinds of contestational claims that they want to make, right, for the claims that they want to make to city government in order to request resources, in order to take direct action against um, abusive property management, in some cases, in order to address things through policy, the data was the necessary evidentiary currency that they had to work with. And so they collect data and then also produce various kinds of representations, such as maps and visualizations that are for advocacy. And in this way, data and their activities with data and our activities as designers working with them is not just about bringing awareness. And that's important. This isn't just, oh, we're going to create a map so that someone can see where these um, evictions are happening, or we're going to create a visualization so someone can see the amount of abandoned buildings in a given neighborhood, but rather, this data and this process of data collection becomes a kind of witnessing right, that's used as evidence in support of demands. Some of those demands are modest, for example, to increase the amount of um, officers within a given neighborhood. Some of those demands are not modest at all and are in fact almost radical. For example, working with the housing advocates who not only wanna lessen um, evictions, but are actually moving towards models such as community land trusts or other forms of housing provision where housing is seen as a right rather than a commodity. So this work provides my background for thinking about this idea of what is the untapped potential between these two fields of design and policy. And again, I wanna preface by saying I'm not a policy expert. I know that there are policy experts in that room and on this call. But what I would say, one of the key untapped potentials is really the capacity of design to make things concrete, right? To materialize issues in forms that are compelling. And this is not my idea alone, right? This is an idea that many folks have had. Um, but one of the things that designers do is designers make things. And one of the qualities of the things that designers make is that they tend to be particular, right? They're about a specific context. Um, they're about the specific factors of an issue. And this capacity to make things concrete, to materialize issues in forms that are compelling, 
provide a medium for contestation or for agonism as was brought up. They provide a way in which we can put something forward um, to disagree about. And they do that in a way that's distinctive because of their particularity. And here, at least from my experience with policy in the States, is where there's a productive tension between design and policy. In my conversations with my policy colleagues or with folks, for example, in city government, the challenge is, is that policy is not particular. Right? Policy is given for a city or a county or a state or a nation. Policy is not given for this particular street, right? Or that particular apartment complex or property management organization. And so in a way, design can act in a space that policy often can't act because policy is not particular. It is more general than design. The benefit here is that what we can do is we can use design as a way to identify the particulars, right? To identify those particulars and perhaps in a concerted effort to gather those particulars together from which policy can then be abstracted. So design is not going to give us usually the overview of what's happening across the city. It's going to give us the instances of what's happening here and there. And in doing so, it's going to provide a view into the on the ground, in the streets sort of engagements between residents and activists, between property owners and landlords, between those folks then and city representatives, state government, perhaps even national government. So, in, in taking the idea of provocation seriously, um, there's sort of two provocations I would leave us with. One is that while we should find the overlap between design and policy, we should also make sure that we understand what the distinctions are. Right? So if you think of these as two circles that are overlapping, there's a fantastic set of opportunities in that overlap there's also very important things that happen, particularly if we want to phrase this in terms of democracy in the spaces that don't overlap. And it's important that we keep those spaces vibrant because what policy and design provide as distinct endeavors is also important. And we need to appreciate that and realize how we can use that to affect changes towards the democratic ends that we are all striving for. Finally, the second provocation I would offer is that as we think about the role of design policy in government, and this is going to be a very particular US perspective, I'm not going to, folks may or may not agree with this where you are at. Um, we also need to recognize the limitations of government as we currently experience it, right? Whether or not the federal government or the state government or even the local municipal government is actually operating in a democratic way is open to debate. And so much of design and so many designers are constantly trying to prove themselves by associating themselves with power that we often get seduced by the idea of working with government. But we have to remember that democracy is actually not uh, a form of government only. And that many times our government engages in very undemocratic acts. And design is important because it allows us to continue to think about that particular, to think about the ways in which democracies are happening in the local, right, through direct action. And that as we think about the relationship between design and policy in service of democracy, it is crucial to remember that government does not provide all of the democratic means that we need for a fair and just life. So with that, I will stop my provocation and pass it off to whoever is next.